you're a different runner every run. You show up some days and you feel amazing. You're like, where did this come from? If I could only bottle this feeling for every run. And then you show up for another run and you wonder who stole all your fitness because you feel heavy and sometimes for no reason, right? This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 130 of the Running for Real podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm really excited that you are joining me. So last week we heard from Claire Gallagher. That was an episode that was really important to me as someone who really cares about the environment. I wanted to focus on this episode and I've been thinking about it for a while. So I'm glad we had the opportunity to kind of talk about some things we can do as runners for the environment, but also what actually really needs to change before anything is going to happen and uh, Claire was great at that. She's also a wonderful ultra runner, um, has won Leadville in the past and uh, is just a really great girl who has a lot of great ideas. So I hope you, if you did miss that one, you will go back and check it out. Now, today we have one of the best coaches in America, if not the world. He's one of the most famous coaches out there for sure. And he's helped thousands to big goals, working with elite runners. He's toured with Lydiard, spent time with Joe V. Hill. This guy knows a lot. And you know that pace calculator you know and love? Yep, it's his idea. Macmillan running. You've sure you've been to that website. We have Greg McMillan on the show. Now you will hear in the interview that Greg and I met at the UCAN breakfast. And I just want to share with you the real story about what happened. So when we were at this Generation UCAN hosted a breakfast for some of their, what they call family and friends of the brand um, when I was in Boston. And, you know, when you get in there, there's all kinds of people like you seeing these faces and these names that you've known. I mean, many of them I already knew, like the other podcasters who were doing the live show with me, Carrie, Lindsay and Ali, um, and many others, other people I knew in there as well. But um, you see these faces that you know of and you think oh I know who that is and I saw Greg and I thought oh that's Greg McMillan and I thought I saw him sit down at the table and I thought him I want to bring him on my podcast so I strategically placed myself next to him and uh, made sure I talked to him during my breakfast and yeah it was great to get to know him and uh He said right there and then that he would love to come on the podcast. So here you are, we have it. So I did kind of stalk him a little bit just to make sure I could get him on here. (laughs) And uh, so my strategic planning with that breakfast worked out because now you get to meet him and I'm not sure otherwise I would have been able to get him on the show. So that's how this came about. But before we go meet him, let's send out a huge thank you to our sponsors. You can tribe, that's a British one for all my British friends. We have a, a British sponsor and body health. So let's thank body health and then get to the episode. Thank you to body health for sponsoring this episode of the running for your podcast. You've heard me talking about body health for a long time for good reason. They are wonderful friends of mine and I truly believe in the product. Body health perfect amino is my go-to recovery product that I've been using for I think about four years now and I don't see it not being a part of my life for a long time. As runners, it helps us to recover faster from hard workouts and races, which can only be a good thing. And if you recover faster, you get more out of your hard workouts and races and you prevent injuries while you do. All of those massive advantages to us as a runner. All you do is take the supplement either as a powder or as tablets at some point during the day, ideally away from food. I like to take mine after a run, give it 23 minutes to work And then you can rest assured your body has been given the eight essential amino acids it needs to maintain its systems. These essential amino acids in Perfect Amino are in the exact proportion needed for maximum utilization from the body. So even if you aren't able to get a meal as soon as you would like, and let's be real, sometimes that happens, you know you're in good hands. Visit tinamuir.com forward slash aminos for more information and to get yourself some. 
Be sure to use the code TINAMUELA10 for 10% off the entire website. So visit tinamuelacom forward slash A-M-I-N-O-S. I love Body Health Perfect Amino and I see that many of you use it daily too, which I love. If you haven't tried it yet, go do it. Greg, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For All podcast. I am really excited to talk to you. I was excited to connect with you in Boston. And glad that we can kind of make this into a podcast so everyone else can hear from you as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be fun. And, uh, you know, you are considered one of the world's, uh, definitely one of America's best coaches out there. And I'm sure most of my listeners have heard of you, if not um, even following your training or um, it definitely, I'm sure, using the pace calculator. That's one of the things (laughs) I think a lot of people will visit your website for. But you know, we hear a lot about the athletes you coach, the things that you do, but tell us a bit about your running journey. How did, how did you start running? Well, it started quite young because I grew up in rural Tennessee on a farm. And so our play was outside and we had a really large range. So I was always running and biking and playing outside quite a bit. And in elementary school, they had a competition was called a field day where you competed in all the different events. It was the long jump and the high jump and the hundred yard dash and the softball throw and all that sort of stuff. And they had the mile run. So I would always win the mile run in elementary school and then go compete for our county championships. And I usually won that. So of course the high school running coach, he just uh, would watch those elementary schools and he just wait until you got older and then invite you to participate. And so I did that uh, from a young age and was able to Pause you there about that. So yeah. your at your school, they would do a mile run at age, what would that be, five, six? That would have been, uh, I was seven, I guess, okay. or eight. Wow, yeah, second that's... or third grade, I guess. I don't uh, remember running more than, I don't know, 400 meters at school until I was maybe 12, 13. So is that pretty typical in the US? I don't think so. I okay. think it was just that they had this idea of this mm. countywide field day And so kids in their PE classes would go and do all these different activities. And one just happened to be, I mean, we did the hundred yard dash. We did all those kind of, you know, pull ups and sit ups and all that stuff as well. Uh, But that was um, one mile. And so Mm -hmm. I don't, then we only did it once per year. We did it once for, you know, to qualify. And then once in the championship, if you qualified to represent your school. So definitely wasn't normal. And it's not like I trained for it. I just, my best friend lived a mile away. And so I think we were just comfortable doing that. So we were at one, two in our school and then also in the championship, maybe just because we had that exposure to it. Mm -hmm. And then what about from there? So you said the high school coaches were kind of watching you and then, uh, did they, you know, start speaking to you as soon as they could and, and brought you on? How did it go after that? Yeah, I got invited to run for the high school when I was in sixth grade Mm -hmm. and uh, didn't really enjoy it, to be honest. I think the age difference uh, Mm -hmm. and the, the, the competition, it was just so different to me. I didn't have a lot in common with those older boys. So and I really loved basketball. I was a good basketball player. So that was my focus. But once I got to high school, I started running for the high school team as a high schooler. And that's where I really fell in love with the sport. We had a wonderful coach and that's when I caught the running bug Uh and it's sort of been with me ever since. Uh And you still run a decent amount now, right? And yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I feel like it's my mental therapy as much Uh as competition anymore, but to get out most days and do a run is, is wonderful. And compete when it's appropriate in my life schedule to get out there and compete. I love that. So, uh, I kind of, you know, was super competitive at different points in my life, but no matter what, I feel like I'm a lifelong runner and Mm -hmm. and hope to continue to do that. And what do you attribute to be able, be able to run from, you know, age, what that would have been probably 14, maybe taking it seriously onwards. Um, cause a lot of people, you know, can't make it, you know, from what I heard on the Sea Tolly Run podcast, you've just turned 50, right? That's right. So that's quite a, a big chunk of time to spend running. What do you attribute to being able to do that? 
I, I think part of it is still chasing the feeling that I got in high school. I think, mm. you know, when you, when you become a runner and every runner knows this, this is why it's almost difficult to have a conversation with a non-runner <laughs> about why you run. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like that deep connection that really is, becomes your passion. I still feel like I'm chasing that. I love that feeling. You get that feeling from training, from racing, from running with others and, you know, being involved in the sport. So I think there's been a really strong sustaining aspect to, to that, which has kind of kept me going. Mm -hmm. I have continued to try to compete across, you know, all my ages and mm -hmm. particularly as I've turned new age groups, I get a little bit more serious about it. So that has helped. I also am not a very durable runner, so mm. I have been injured a lot. And I think as a result, I've controlled my training a little bit more than uh, people who are not quite as durable can really do a lot more and maybe burn themselves out or mm. run into injuries that ultimately, you know, cause them to leave the sport. So while it has not been pleasant to not be able to train at the level that I wish I could, I think it has allowed me to sustain a running career for a yeah. long time. And how did, how long did it take you to find peace with that? Just the, you know, realizing that maybe you're not as durable as everyone else. Cause I'd imagine that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. I'm still trying to swallow that pill. I still don't <laughs> like it. I, I, um, you know, I'm competitive and I, I want to see how good I can be. And, and obviously I understand what it takes to run at a high level mm -hmm. and when you can't do the work that, you know, sort of matches up with your goals, then that becomes kind of stressful. So I would say <laughs> I'm not quite over it yet. And I kind of, sometimes it's more, you know, I, I'm more frustrated with it than other times. And so it kind of just varies through life, but mm -hmm. I probably will never get over it because I don't think I'll ever be able to train at the level I wish I could. Yeah. And that's tricky, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening kind of understand that same feeling, especially you know, I've been thinking a lot about, um, uh, you don't know this, but, uh, I think I mentioned to you once before that I was an elite runner before I, um, kind of took some time off and I recently jumped in at 5k, my first 5k in like three months. And I ran uh, on a, a day, it was 75 degrees. I ran 18, 11. And, you know, as much as I was like, huh, that's pretty good. Um, I'm sure that frustrated people thinking, what? like, how did you just do that? Like not really doing much and then just managing to throw that out there. So, um, you know, what would be your advice for someone who does look at someone who can, um, you know, maybe do something like that, just jump in a race and run at fast time or, um, who is able to handle higher mileage and they're kind of, um, struggling with it. You said that you're still working through it, but what have you picked up along the way when you are in those moments of kind of like, ah, my stupid body isn't working. <laughs> Well, I think it's acceptance is the most important thing. Otherwise you drive yourself crazy. Mm -hmm. So you have to have acceptance of what is, and you have to have an appreciation for other situations, right? So obviously if you're an elite runner, you're always going to be able to gain fitness really quickly mm -hmm. and run faster than some people who train forever to, you know, run well, that's just part of it. And so you have to have some acceptance. We see it at Boston a lot, right? There's yeah. some people, they work for years and years to try to qualify for Boston and then they'll have someone join their running group and, you know, mm -hmm. in their first marathon, they easily qualify for Boston and yeah. it's like they pull their hair out. So I think part of it is acceptance of what is and not sort of having an expectation that's not right or at least realistic mm -hmm. and, and working within yourself. I mean, one of the things about running is it's you, you, you determine it all, right? Yeah. You determine so much of it. And so you do what you can do and, and others, you can't really control their situations. You can't pick their parents for them. So you can't change their <laughs> genetics or what they mm -hmm. inherited. You can't change what their circumstances might've been or, or what they might be now. You know, we have some older runners now that train as much, it's like elite runners because mm -hmm. they're sort of semi-retired and their life is comfortable and they can really train a lot harder than mm -hmm. some of us who are still, you know, have to work a lot. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And um, maybe we I was going to go into this a bit later, but it kind of seems to be a good time to talk about it now. Um, you know, you mentioned about struggling at times with um, kind of essentially accepting where you are, accepting what your body is able to do. So I had a question from one of my Patreon members, which is, 
how do you stay motivated to stay competitive and and how have you adjusted those personal goals as you have aged you know it is difficult to kind of just say all right my best days are behind me um like you said chasing uh age group records and, and places and stuff but what else would you suggest for masters runners well for me i i really accepted that i was just trying to do the best i could at the moment and so i certainly didn't after I ran close to four minutes for the mile, I knew I was never going to do that yeah. again as I age. So I didn't invest in, you know, the times as much as it was, am I competing to the mm-hmm. best of my ability? Am I competing against my competition to the best of my ability? And, you know, I was national champion in the trail marathon when I turned 40. So as a master's, so obviously I wasn't thinking I'm going to run as fast as I have in the marathon. I was just what do I need to do to compete at this particular moment in time? So for me, it has been a little bit less about worrying about the numbers per se, and a lot more about, am I getting the most out of myself? Am I competing to the level that I know I can? Am I making smart racing decisions? Am I training in a smart way to set myself up for success? Thank you to Tribe for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Tribe is the UK's leading all-natural sports nutrition brand who provide a range of over 20 natural energy and recovery products. Now, I told you a little bit about Tribe last week, and I'm absolutely loving their bars. They have protein bars. They have a marathon training pack. You can make your own pack. They have a sampler pack. There's all kinds of things you can check out on the Tribe website. Some of my favorite flavors are the coffee and walnut protein bar and the chocolate salted caramel energy bar. Now, I just want to tell you a bit about some of the events that Tribe are doing. And I want to tell you about the Tribe Run for Love, which is an upcoming running event where they're pushing the limits of human endurance with a 280 kilometer run in six days to fight modern slavery through the Freedom Foundation pretty cool that they are doing that, really testing themselves to try and bring awareness to a key issue that's really important. You can find out more about Run for Love and Tribe's products by going to wearetribe.co. And if you use the promo code Tina Muir, you will get a £2 first box when you subscribe to Tribe. You can head to wearetribe.co forward slash Tina Muir to get that offer straight away. That's wearetribe.co forward slash Tina Muir to claim your offer. For me, it has been a little bit less about worrying about the numbers per se, and a lot more about, am I getting the most out of myself? Am I competing to the level that I know I can? Am I making smart racing decisions? Am I training in a smart way to set myself up for success? Those things I've focused on a little bit more. So I haven't had that same feeling, which I think is fairly common of mm-hmm. like, well, I, I know I'll never run a faster half marathon than I already have. So what's the point? Yeah, that wasn't kind of what I'm in the sport for. I'm, I know I'll never come close to what I have run in the half marathon, but I don't mind training for one and seeing how fa- how well I can do. Uh-huh. Because for me, I think ultimately it's the process of you know, in a race, when it sort of comes down, like the whole world narrows down oh, to yeah. just in, in your own head. I really enjoy that part. So I like that component. So for me, you know, the time is the time. It doesn't matter. And it really, you know, you have different courses and wind and conditions. So for me, it's all about that experience. And so that kind of removes worrying too much about Oh man, 30 years ago, I ran really fast and now I can't do that. I Uh still, you know, I still go out and just try to do the best I can for where I am now. And I hope I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot with this, but you saying that kind of makes me think in some ways, it's actually kind of nice that you don't have the pressure of, well, you know, I'm trying to run faster than I ever have before. I'm putting it all out there because I know this is the, the, like, the best I'm ever going to be. So I better make the most of it. Is, is that right? Or am I kind of, I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend people by saying you, you know, take advantage of feeling that way because it's the best you're going to be. Yeah. I think everybody's different, right? Mm. I mean, 
you know, if you've worked, you know, I ran in college and then obviously worked with pro athletes and there's some of them that that's their goal is just how fast can I run? And once they've done that, they're done and they move on to other things and they may run, but they may not. That that just may be the end of it for them. And that's what they were trying to get from the sport. And then other people, you know, are the opposite. And for them, time is less of a concern and it's more about, the experience and the the racing component can be done for many different reasons at different points in their lives. And, you know, running is just not a straight line up (laughs) and that's the biggest problem. If you can kind of live through the, the ebbs and the flows and understand that it's, it's going to be going really well at periods of time. And then maybe for things out of your control, it's not going to go as well. And you got to be able to kind of roll with the punches if you want to kind of be a lifelong runner, which I think a lot of people say they want to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. So just switching topics a bit here. Now I met you at the generation you can breakfast and, uh, you know, I've talked about you can a lot, um, and people have heard my perspective, know that I carried it with me in Boston. But as you are coach to many recreational athletes who aren't going to have the luxury of ever having a bottle handed to them in an elite table, why is it that you recommend your athletes use it? You know, especially if that means they have to carry it as a, as opposed to grabbing a gel on the side of the road. Well, I think for a lot of people, the sort of traditional method of fueling for the marathon, you know, which is sort of the dose you know, rest dose again, sort of Mm -hmm. repetition that you have in most of the traditional sports drink or gel type method can work. But a lot of people have GI problems Mm -hmm. with that. And then a lot of people end up not fueling enough later in the race because their stomach gets upset or because they miss a dose and then their blood glucose gets a little bit too low and then they have trouble recovering. So I was kind of on the search for, well, is there kind of a a solution for people Mm. who are having that problem. And so I think these more slow acting carbohydrate sources that you don't have to take as frequently during the race. And it's the timing of it is not quite as critical as with the fast acting, you know, spike and crash uh, phenomenon. I think that works very well for runners and people already carry gels when they go and run. So you can easily make generation you can into a paste and put it in a Ziploc bag. And so carry it just like a gel. Yeah. So the actual delivery of it through the race is, is not, you know, that big of a, an issue. And if people already carry bottles, maybe when they do a race, then obviously you can easily use it in that way. So I think there's definitely uh, people have figured out solutions for, you know, using something like generation you can to help them have steadier energy and avoid some of those GI issues and some of the, you know, yucky stuff that comes with trying to put so much uh, fast acting carbohydrate in your body. You know, that gel that tasted delicious at mile five that you want to vomit at mile 20 is a tough thing for people. I don't know if I'd ever say a gel tastes delicious. I, (laughs) it's the texture for me. It's like that, like, Actually, um, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast, I can't remember, but I did a half marathon a few months ago and I forgot my UCAN and I um I had to choke down a gel because I realized at mile 10 that, you know, I haven't eaten anything and I'm running a half marathon here uh, even before. I grabbed a gel and I did the whole like <laughs> thing as you're trying to chew it down and you're trying to swallow it, but you can't. And yeah, I I can't say I missed that experience much at all. But and I just want to say to everyone listening, this was not planned. Generation Uhan did not tell me to say this. I was genuinely just curious. Um, you know, obviously Greg has worked with thousands of athletes, um, and it is what he recommends. So I I just was genuinely curious myself of of you know what you thought about that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, we're problem solvers as runners, right? If you have an issue, you try to find a workaround for it. And I think for a lot of runners, having this uh, other option has been really helpful to them so that they can feel more powerful at the end of the race, at the end of a marathon. That's what you're going for. For sure. All right. So we can talk a bit more about your running journey, maybe in a little while, but for now I'd like to talk about coaching. I mentioned just a minute ago, working with a lot of athletes, both at the elite level and at the recreational level. And you used to work or you had a group um, called the Adidas uh, Macmillan Elite, which I'd love for you to tell us a bit about what that group was, 
um, what your and what your experience was working with you know a group of elite runners. I mean, that must be kind of a dream job for many people. Yeah, it was really cool. I had the opportunity to work with uh, an earlier team in the beginning, the turn of the century, the two thousand, the <laughs> two thousand two or three. And so I kind of got a taste of working with, well, I actually been lucky. So even when I started coaching, when I was quite young, uh, initially a, a few of my early athletes were Olympic trials quali- quality athletes. So I had fairly early exposure yep. to some of that. And then, you know, the big thing in the U S was that we only sent one man and one woman to the 2000 Olympic games in the marathon. And that just seemed crazy. Right. And so all of these people started like, we have to do something. This isn't right. And that inspired me, the work, particularly of Bob Larson and Joe V Hill, what they did in Mammoth with Team USA California at that time, the Hanson, Zap Fitness. There were a whole bunch of groups that kind of started around that period with this idea that, hey, we need to do something to help U.S. distance running. And so it took a few years because, uh, you know, I have a wife and it took a while to say, hey, why don't you quit your job and let's move to the (laughs) mountains and I want to coach these people. Oh, so that's why you moved there? Yeah, yeah. We had investigated 15 cities across the U.S. to find what I felt like was the best place for training for, you know, the goals that I had. And I had a laundry list and Flagstaff, Arizona, you know, checked most of those boxes. So that's when we moved there. Can you share any, maybe two or three of the other ones you were considering? Just curious. Uh, Next in line was like Lake Tahoe. I really liked it there. I also like Colorado Springs area because Olympic Training Center was there. Uh, Big Bear outside of um, LA is a good place as well. So, you know, the usual place. So eventually I convinced her to quit her job. And so we moved to Flagstaff and I had started going to Flagstaff a year or so before bringing athletes. I had a woman that won the Houston marathon and she was looking to go the next level. And so we, I went up there with her for two or three months and really we're having, we're having really good success. So, you know, I just started saying, I want to start a group And luckily i had had a relationship with Adidas because I'd run for them when I finished college and Uh they were willing to come on board initially, very, very small amount of support. (laughs) Uh, but it was enough for me to go out and sell the idea that, Hey, you're coming out of college. You're pretty good. Why don't you devote two or three or four years and let's see how good you can be. You can come live. We'll train as a group. I'll be there every day for you. And let's just kind of see if you can go to the next level, see if you can take it to the next level. And that's kind of how it started. And we started having some pretty good success. And then, you know, it got a little better and a little better. And so what then happened next? Like what, what made you decide to think and, and what year was, was this um, that you decided, OK, you know, I think I'm going to step away from this. Well, I started in 2007 is when Adidas McMillan Elite started. And then our contract with Adidas ended at the end of 2013. And they let us know that they were not going to renew that contract. And so we were kind of left without any support Mm -hmm. going forward. And it was around that same time that some of the athletes that had originally been part of the group were now transitioning, you know, in their lives. They were relationships, marriage, kids and all that. And then some of the athletes that were thinking about building the team around, they were moving to different situations. And then I had a, a that, at that time, a five-year-old son and he mm-hmm. started to miss me because yeah. there was quite a bit of travel. So, you know, once I started to look at all those things combined, it was like, you know what, this might be a good time to take a step back and, you know, focus on my family and coaching you know, more of my focus on coaching record, you know, non elite athletes. Mm-hmm. And, um, luckily I was able to do that and have mcmillanrunning.com, which is, you know, what I do most of my coaching with. Yep. And, and, you know, it was not long after that, that, um, Ben Rosario kind of came along and, and started up Northern Arizona elite, um, who have now become a pretty big powerhouse <laughs> within, uh, American distance running. And I'm interested to hear you th- your thoughts on, you know, you mentioned around that time, 2007, which actually Greg, um, when I graduated from college, I being British 
knew I was at a long shot, but I'm pretty sure um, my coach um, actually reached out to all of the groups and said, would you want, you know, to bring on this girl? And I think every one of them, there was one that said maybe, but I'm pretty sure he reached out to you and you said no. Yeah, we were Adidas. We were a U.S. Yeah, yeah and we I were U.S. It. focused, so yeah. it was difficult to have non-U.S. Yeah, no, and I totally that, understood it. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I could, I didn't hold it against anyone. Um, but it's <laughs> pretty funny that I graduated in 2012. Sorry, I said 2007. I graduated in 2012, and I'm so he would have reached out to you. So that's quite funny, actually. Now looking back at it, um, yeah. But well, anyway, we, we would have loved to have had you yeah. know lots of people, but we were. You know, one of the things that was really tough is we were just really financially constrained and that created a lot of issues. And anytime you have sponsors and stuff, you, you run into conflicts with that sort of thing. But anyway, it was great. We had a lot of fun. I wasn't planning. I wasn't um, making a dig at you. It just kind of like dawned on me that, um, but anyway, so you mentioned all these groups were popping up. Um, You know, you mentioned Zap, you mentioned Hanson's, you mentioned um, Mammoth Track Club. Um, yourself, how much of that do you do you feel like you played any part in this kind of boom of distance running that's now kind of happening in the American distance is really stepped it up a level, particularly in the women's, but in the men's as well. Um, and you know, is it one of those cases where you guys kind of built the foundations and it just took some time to get kind of the right people into the sport um, to kind of take off from there? Well, I think we, I hope so. I mean, that was sort of the purpose of Mm -hmm. the group. So I I certainly hope so. I know that we provided opportunities for athletes Mm -hmm. and many of them had success, maybe not to the level that they had dreamed of, but I I know that we provided that opportunity. I do feel like we were sort of an in-between, you know, Mm -hmm. you had the early groups like with Mammoth and Zap and Hanson's. And then there was that kind of period in the middle where maybe McMillan elite was one of the, the ones sort of leading the charge. And we were, you know, winning club cross country, men and women, we were putting Mm -hmm. people on world championships and national championships. So we were kind of filling that gap and buying some time maybe until, you know, you had opportunities for athletes to start making more money and the groups be more better funded and potentially understanding the value of place and how you can get set up in the right place yeah. and you can really, you know, Flagstaff is a Mecca. It really is. Yeah. I mean, people go there, there's, you throw a rock, you hit 10 fast runners for sure. Both Greg and I love Generation You Can. We don't just use it ourselves on a daily basis, but we recommend it to everyone we know as often as we can. It really is the best way to fuel yourself in races. Yes, even if that means you carrying it on you like I did in Boston. It's also the best for daily fuel. I take a peanut butter bar every day before I run. The steady energy release in the bars and the powders mean there are none of those crashes on those long runs, workouts or in races. Just steady energy that keeps you feeling level and like you can keep on facing those nasty cruel voices in your head that are telling you to slow down. We're going to tell them to shut up and get on with it. Of course the mental side is going to always come to get us in the races and that's actually what my mental training course is going to be working to help us to deal with them. But the nutrition aspect, using you can, you will take care of that. You can get 25% off your order, even if you've already ordered Generation You Can before, by visiting generationyoucan.com and using code TINAMUA25. I'll give you a short link just so it's easier to remember. You can go to tinamuacom forward slash you can, that's U-C-A-N, which will direct you straight to their website. So what are you waiting for? Go use it. Go try it for yourself. Find it at tinamuir.com forward slash you can use code tinamuir25. And if you aren't sure what to get, they have a sampler pack, so you can easily just get that and try it out. Maybe McMillan Elite was one of the, the ones sort of leading the charge. And we were, you know, winning club cross country, men and women. We were putting mm-hmm. people on world championships and national championships. So we were kind of filling that gap. And buying some time maybe until, you know, you had opportunities for athletes to start making more money and the groups be more better funded and 
potentially understanding the value of place and how you can get set up in the right place. Yeah. And you can really, you know, Flagstaff is a Mecca. It really is. Yeah. I mean, people go there, there's, you throw a rock, you hit 10 fast runners for sure. <laughs> You know, while I certainly miss a lot of aspects of it, I'm really excited to when I see athletes that were part of McMillan Elite yeah. that now are having such great success, mainly because they've continued to be there. I feel like that they had this, and that's part of the problem with becoming a pro runner and succeeding is it just takes a long time. And mm-hmm. so, you know, a lot of these athletes now, they've been there five, seven years, and they're kind of having this catch up idea of being able to then run and train at levels that can lead them to run very fast times. And can you share with us who some of those were? Yeah. Stephanie Bruce, Stephanie Rothstein, when she was with me, mm-hmm. you know, she broke two thirty there with me when, you know, we had that group and then, you know, she's continued to go and now she's won a couple of national championships. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kellen, uh, Taylor now, um, you know, she's gone on to do wonderful things. So I think those, those two yeah. athletes in particular oh, yeah. are showing that, you know, they stay there and they've stayed motivated and they've continued to develop. Sure. Well, thank you for explaining that. And, and really cool to hear. Um, now, another thing you're known for is we mentioned the earlier, your pace calculator. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask you a few questions about this, but firstly, before I kind of get into the deeper ones, where did the idea for this come from and, and how did you kind of come up with the numbers to go along with it? Well, when I started coaching, I was an undergrad and so I was quite young. And when you and I always coached a wide range of abilities. So I mm-hmm. worked with beginning runners, just kind of getting started, charity marathon type groups, you know. And then I had a lot of age group athletes. And then, as I mentioned, I had a, a couple of runners who were, who were really good. Yeah. And so if you coach a wide range, you, you have to have some ability to talk about pacing for workouts and races, because it's easy if somebody's kind of of your same ability, all the paces make sense to you. Right. Uh But if you're an elite runner like yourself and you're used to running six and a half minutes per mile is your easy run. Well, somebody that runs, you know, races a marathon at 11 minutes per mile, that doesn't even compute in their brain. So (laughs) I needed a system that could prescribe the optimal training for paces for all runners. And I was using the various methods that were currently available, but none of them kind of met what I wanted, uh, what I felt like would be good. And then my research in graduate school was on this idea of connecting real world performance with the physiological hmm. um, sort of variables. And so I started making that connection stronger and stronger. And so ultimately, the calculator as it is now was just a big notebook filled with spreadsheets that I had done in Excel so that I could look, open the book, go to the athlete's level and then, you know, give them their times. Um, and so it was really selfish on my part because I needed it for my coaching. And I happened to put it on my website and it was on like the third page of one of the articles, which is called the six step training system. And my buddy who helped me program it and actually put it on the web, Mm -hmm. he was like, have you looked at the analytics? Something is going on on this page. (laughs) I was like, oh, I wonder if it's that calculator. And of course, now it's quite popular. Yeah, no, definitely. I I mean, I've I've used it in the past and I know I know a lot of other people who have Um, (laughs) now for those listening who are avid users of it, of it. Do you have any maybe disclaimers or things you want to remind people um, about that calculator just for, you know, um, a lot of people kind of get a bit caught up in it and think, you know, uh, maybe one of their times is, you know, way ahead of the rest of them. Why can't I run as fast as my other events or the other way? Um, I have one time that just doesn't line up with the rest of these. What's wrong with me? What would you like to say? Well, obviously there's a few kind of coaches notes that go along (laughs) with it. The first is the predictability is better the closer the event distance is. So, you know, your mile time predicting the marathon is not as strong as if you're half marathon predicting the marathon. So Mm -hmm. that's one thing is to understand that, you know, as you get farther away from sort of your, the event you're training for, it's less predictive. The second thing is a lot of people 
you know, if you train for one event and you don't have this breadth of I've trained for the half mile, I've trained for the mile, I've trained for the half marathon, I've trained for the marathon, you can expect that there will be some differences in one to the other. And it either shows maybe you're just selectively better at those events, or it could be you just haven't taken a period of time to try to work on that. And so you know, sometimes people need to, you know, have a period of time where maybe they're focused on uh, one of the predictions that they want to improve. Sometimes that can help. And the same with the training paces, you know, there, there's a range for all of those. And if you're in that range, you're doing really well, but if it starts to get hot and humid, then you've got to adjust those because those are for, you know, your standard conditions. So there's kind of the, if you use common sense, they uh, can provide a good guide. And ultimately it's just a guide. It's just try to get you narrowed into the ballpark. And then mm -hmm. your training results should inform the training paces and it should also inform your race predictions. So it all ties together. And ultimately in running, we're just trying to get down to effort levels. Ultimately, it's like, how can I hold this effort level for this long? Because that's what I need to do for my goal. So that, that's good you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about that. Earlier on, when I asked you about your own running right now, you were saying that you've got to the point where ultimately it's about, you know, doing your best, kind of getting the most out of yourself. Now, for those listening, where do you fall on kind of running by feel? Because someone might look at their training paces and say, well, you know, Greg McMillan says I should be running this pace. But like you said, hot and humid, or maybe you had a race two days before and it's kind of beating you up. Where do you kind of fall? Do you tend to, to even yourself now go by the paces that you feel like you're in line with? Or do you recommend that people actually in their training tend to go more by feel? I think that for a lot of the running feel is works great. Mm -hmm. So for easy running and long runs and, you know, just when you're out there for an aerobic run, effort is a wonderful tool to use. The paces from the McMillan calculator, you know, they're quite wide for mm -hmm. the endurance zone. And so it shows that you don't have to worry about pushing the pace, just go out and get that effort in. And I think when you get into the more specific workouts, maybe the stamina zone, like tempo runs and certainly speed workouts and things like that, those get a little bit more tied into what your goals are, where you are currently in fitness and what you're building towards. So that's where people kind of move a little bit more toward, okay, this pace range, I want to make sure I'm trying to hit that. And obviously if you're having a really bad day or the weather conditions are compromising your performance, you adjust. So I would say I'm kind of a hybrid. I feel like after a runner kind of learns their effort levels for an easy run or just a regular long run, just go run by effort. The talk test is a wonderful tool to use, right? It just yep. connects us with that. But if you're a performance runner and you're trying to say run certain times, obviously goal pace running, goal pace is the key. It, you know, you're trying to hit that. And then for some of the more specific workouts, you want to see you know, hitting those times, then how do you feel? And hopefully over time you hit those times, but you feel, it feels easier to mm -hmm. you. So there's all those kind of training process things that go into it. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Thank you for explaining. And just one more thing related to that. Someone looking at the, let's say the easy running training pace and thinking, okay, well, it says a range of, I don't know, let's say eight minutes to, to nine minutes. Um, so does that mean if I'm running on the eight minute end of things, then, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fitter than if I was running on the nine minute range of things, anything you'd like to say to someone who kind of feels like, Oh, well he said eight to nine. So I better be on the eight end. I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> In fact, the, the newsletter, I send a newsletter out via email every week. And this one was about optimizing every day. And it talks specifically about that with an athlete using an example, because a lot of times, particularly for newer runners, yeah. they feel like faster is better. Yes. So if the pace range is eight minutes to nine minutes per mile, then obviously eight minutes per mile, that means I'm getting better. Yes. But the problem with that is that you're a different runner every run. Mm -hmm. And you know that you show up some days and you feel amazing. You're like, where did this come from? If I could only bottle this feeling for every run. And then you show up for another run and you wonder who stole all your fitness because you feel heavy and tired and sometimes for no reason. Right. So because we're humans, we have to be a little bit more open to how you're feeling each day. So if you go into a run and you're not feeling good, run toward the slow end. 
Because if you run toward the fast end, you actually be overtraining. You're not working with your body. Your body's saying, hey, I'm tired. I'm sending you these signals to say, I need a little bit more recovery. And then you're going to push the pace toward the fast end. That doesn't make, you know, that just extends the fatigue and the recovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm really trying to teach athletes to, as they go for their run, sense how are you feeling and that shows you where you might slide in the in the pace range. Mm-hmm. So for somebody who's not feeling good, then run toward the slower end is the smarter yep. pace for that day. Running yep. toward the fast end would be wrong. And the converse is the same as well. Because some people just, you know, I want to run slow all the time. It's like, yeah, but you missed the fitness opportunity because you felt really good that day. You should have been running more like eight minutes per mile. That would have been mm-hmm. perfect. The fast end of the range would have been an optimal stimulus for your body for that day. So I'm big into you got to listen to your body and you got to learn to go with your body as to how you're feeling. And that allows you to optimize that training for the day. The pace range is there, but it's just a guide. It doesn't, the calculator doesn't feel what you feel. Uh So you need to be in charge of your own training and make those adjustments. That's kind of my big teaching with my athletes is like, Let's teach you how to optimize your own training to basically be your own coach so that you can make those on on the fly decisions based on how you're feeling, the environment, your life stress, all of those things go into, okay, how should today go? And that's what I was doing with the pro athletes, right? I'm doing it in person. They're showing up. And my first thing is, how are you doing? Getting a sense of how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I'm a little concerned, like I'm not sure they're giving me the right story, I'll I'll, have a corny joke or something like that, because I know if they roll their eyes, they're okay, right? If they don't (laughs) respond like I expect them to respond to one of my corny jokes, I'm like, oh, that athlete's tired. Mm -hmm. We might need to adjust. So that's sort of what every athlete needs to learn across their running career. And then it opens up your potential Mm -hmm. because you have fewer of those bad workouts, the ones that don't go well, that you end up beating yourself up over and you start to lose confidence and all that. Those start to go away. Injuries start to go away. And then you start stacking successful week on top of successful week. And as you know, that's all it takes to really see how good you can be. Absolutely. Well, thank you for explaining that. And I totally agree. Although one thing <laughs> you mentioned about your corny jokes, you made one at the Unica you can breakfast, which um, I did here. And it's definitely, I would consider, if, if this is your typical style, it was considered, I would say, a dad joke. And it was about Varen at UCAN. And he is he is a new dad. So it was kind of uh, perfect. But it was definitely the dad dad joke kind of a mindset, which I I always love that. Um, the second thing, okay. Someone who's saying, I get what you're saying. I hear that, but I really struggle to understand what that means. I I don't know how to listen to my body. You know, running is just hard anyway. So how do I know if I'm listening? Like, what do you give advice to other recreational athletes you coach who struggle with that? Well, first off, we have to make that connection with effort levels. And so having some variety in training helps new runners start to figure out, oh, this is easy for this amount of time. This starts to get easy, medium, medium. This is hard. This is really hard. Having those different exposures to different effort levels, then I think helps them start to say, okay, this is what is easy. And I use the talk test with a lot of new runners. So if you can carry on a conversation through your run, which is what a lot of us like to do, then that's the endurance zone. If you start to be able to only speak in sort of sentences before you start losing your breath, then you're starting to get in the stamina zone. If you can only get out a word or two or a phrase, you're probably in the speed zone. If you can't talk at all, you're in the sprint zone. So beginning to help athletes start to tease out and slice up their effort levels and their breathing and connect all of those back to different paces I think begins to inform them about how they can expect to feel. And then if they feel different, they can make some adjustment. And what about, so you mentioned humidity earlier and um, for those, you know, four stages, four things you mentioned, do you find that, you know, when it is, you know, a hundred percent humidity, a dew point of 72, or maybe it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit and, you know, it's, it's bitterly cold or if it's windy or something, 
that sometimes an easy run is just never going to be quite easy enough because you're always just going to struggle just a little bit. Any thoughts on that? Well, there's, there's kind of two different sufferings that go on, right? So your effort level related to how hard the run is, there is the sort of breathing component, which I think is a great connection with how hard your body is working. And then there's just the yucky component, which is what I think what you get when you run in really hot and humid conditions. It's not that you breathe that much faster when you're on your easy run. It's just that the level of suffering or the effort mm -hmm. is just, it's more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So being t teasing that out a little bit, I think can help differentiate between, you know, it feeling hard yeah. from it's feeling hard and I'm breathing fast. Right. So it's a, the long run is a good example. So long run should be an easy effort, but obviously when you get fatigued toward the end, it's not easy, but that easy isn't that you're breathing really heavy. Like you're doing a speed workout. It's just the fatigue in the body. Mm -hmm. I think training in hot and humid conditions is kind of the same. You have yeah. to differentiate between those two. Mm -hmm. And same with altitude kind of comes into it that same, that same way. Yeah. Anything where you have to adjust, you need to be smart about adjusting. Running into the wind is a good example of that as well. Athletes having to, you know, they get really focused on, I've got to hit these paces, but mm -hmm. you're like, well, but you were running straight into the wind. Why would you expect to hit the paces, you know, take a Herculean effort to run that <laughs> into those conditions. So making sure you can adjust. So a lot of it is about adjustment. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of something that I think for those listening who do struggle with this, you'll learn over time. It is frustrating maybe for Greg and I to just say, you know, you'll learn, you'll listen to your body, but unfortunately that is part of it. You just kind of over time can start to understand your own body and how it feels. So yeah. All right. I want to switch gears. You are big into prehab. So for those listening who hear this word thrown around, what does that even mean to you? To me, prehab means not before rehab. So we <laughs> always have this, you know, we have this huge injury problem in running where so many runners get injured and you know obviously it ruins so many new runners as well as pro runners and all of us have had these issues so as we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated in understanding how to adjust training we also know we need to build the body take care of the body so that it can handle the training that you want to do and so a big focus i think going forward and you see it at the pro level as well as you know recreation level is people doing things to shore up their body, keep it working correctly, build the stability and the strength and the mobility that they need to be able to handle the training. And that will keep injuries at bay. So aches and pains and tightness, do, you know, don't progress. And then also it allows you to handle more training. So, you know, part of a running injury is simply an overuse injury. It's mm -hmm. just you did too much of it. So now you've kind of raised that threshold of what is too much by doing more of this sort of core strength, mobility, balance, all of those kinds of things can be quite helpful. So what are some examples for someone listening who hasn't, you know, are you talking about getting in the gym and doing weightlifting? Are you talking about doing a warm up before you run? What are the, some of the things you have your athletes do? It can be all of those. I would say that most of the people that I work with now are busy professionals. So mm -hmm. it's difficult to require them to sort of have a big gym session <laughs> like, you know, yeah. pro athletes do. So a lot of what I'm doing is a lot more body weight type things. Things are very approachable uh, movements that don't take very long and you can do in your house or at the car when you're going to go for your run or at the office don't require a full like go to the gym and use the this equipment. So I have found that while, you know, certainly that would be awesome if you had your own personal strength trainer at the gym, for most runners, a little bit of prehab goes a long way because most of us have the same injury over and over again. We've got the same part of our body that's tight or loose or not strong enough or too strong or something like so if we just work on it on a regular basis before that ache or that pain or that tightness progresses to an injury, then you can keep training because if you can just interrupt that injury cycle by adjusting your training, being smart with your training first, so you don't get those aches and pains as much and then building a body that can handle it. You can, you can pretty much, you know, kick the injury bug unless you sort of push the limits of your ability in different training segments from time to time. 
So for someone who is thinking, okay, I'll give this a try. Um, how much time you mentioned working with a lot of busy people, just to kind of convince someone here, how, how much or how little time are you talking about in a week of that trying to add in? Well, we would try before run, if you have time, it's only maybe one to three minutes okay. of movements can help you feel better, particularly on those often er injured areas. Again, there's a lot of things that you can do, but you want to narrow it down to what do I need to do? Uh -huh. So for me, it's my calves, right? My calves are my issue. I never have a problem with anything else. So I only have to focus on my calves. So those are, you know, to do movement exercises on my calves before a run is a piece of cake. And then after, which is usually when you would do more extensive things, you, you're talking maybe five to 20 minutes, depending on if you're just doing mobility or if you're going to do core and some of the strength exercises. So, and, and you only have to do sort of those core and strength exercises two to three times a week. So it's not a huge time uh -huh. uh, commitment uh -huh. to kind of start the process. You just got to be patient with it. You got to uh -huh think this like, okay, six months from now, I'm going to be That's a completely different thing, person. <laughs> yeah. We live in an immediate gratification world. So, okay. Yeah. Make, make, give us one last ditch attempt for someone, uh, not naming any names, Tina, who, <laughs> especially now is terrible at struggling to find the motivation to do any things like this. And for someone who always puts it off saying, you know, I'm going to do it this evening when I'm watching TV and then TV comes around. I'm just too tired or mm. I'm going to do it tomorrow. So tomorrow comes around. Oh, I'm running late. Uh, what would be your last bit of a, an attempt to get, get someone to do some prehab? Two movements. Pick the two movements that you know will have the biggest impact to help you with your issue. Just two. And then make it part of your run whether it's before the run or immediately after, and then commit to it. So you have to make it like a streak, right? You have to make it part of the run. It has to be part of your routine and your religiousness. And sometimes it's helpful to think, man, I know when I'm injured, I'd give anything to go yeah. back and not be here. So you can, you know, whatever mental tricks you need to do, but if you can connect it to the running, I think that is very helpful because most of us, can easily get thrown off from our plan because of work and family and life. So I'm a big fan of two movements. Surely you can do two movements <laughs> that are really specific to your areas and tie it in with your run. And for me, I make it, you know, like every run has to be this way. And then if I miss one or two, it's not a big deal. Right. Whereas if I say I'm going to do this three times a week, I'm less likely to, you know, something can happen. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Make it very religious. OK, great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, now, just popping back to Masters running for just a minute. I did read an article you wrote on um, Masters training age versus chronological age. Um, and we do have a lot of Masters runners that listen. So um, in that you talked about full spectrum, start, stop, start again, Masters runners and newbie Masters runners. So. For those who have been feeling a bit confused, we mentioned comparison at the beginning of the interview with someone who's saying, hey, well, we're both, you know, 42 years old and yet he can do this and I can't. Um, what would you say there? Well, it, yeah, it really depends on where the athlete's coming from. So, you know, when I was in graduate school studying exercise physiology, there was this sort of predicted drop off in performance. You know, it was, that's what everybody thought. But mm -hmm. these days we have so many people that are staying active older. So they've been active their entire life. Mm -hmm. They've been really good. Joan Bono Samuelson is a perfect yes. example of uh -huh. that, right? She's like, holy cow, her ability to be really good and stay really good is amazing. And then you have some athletes that are coming into the sport later in life they never knew they were so talented mm -hmm. and they can really go out there and train. And so what you're able to do as you age is, you know, in fact, sometimes people say, Hey, you didn't ask me about age in this training. And I was like, yeah, but I have some 70 year olds who train pretty much more than some 35 year olds <laughs> because of their situation versus the 35 year olds. Mm -hmm. So age is, you know, there's some change we have to make if you recognize it in your body, but it's, it's not so concrete mm -hmm. that you have to give up on it because you're older and athletes that 
have stayed in the sport. They have one kind of experience with aging and then athletes who are older and start the sport when they're older, they have a totally different kind of experience with it. Well, thank you for explaining that because I think that is an important point. And, and you're right. I, you know, when I've heard of people, um, talking about their running and they are masters, it's one of the first things they mention. I'm blah, blah, blah years old. Um, as if that is, you know, affecting things and maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Um, so thank you for explaining that. Right. So I have four more questions for you, just kind of some fun ones to finish off with, but before we get to that, uh, what's next for you? Um, you know, obviously still enjoying, uh, working on Macmillan running, um, And, you know, if someone is interested, they can obviously go find you if they um, would like to work with you for coaching or to get, what is the free thing you have on your course, uh, have on your website? It's a free training course, was it? Yeah, run. it's called Run Team. And that's where you get your training program, you get all your prehab, access to me for questions as you're going along. And then there's community aspect of it as well, because we have athletes from around the globe in there. Okay. So that's one option, but what, is there anything else in the pipeline that you would love to do, you know, in the, in the coming years? Well, you know, for me, it's just about participating in the sport and helping. I'll probably relaunch my coaching certification program in the next year, because I love working with younger coaches who are mm-hmm. getting in the sport and kind of I've had a really unique uh, opportunity to work with some really fascinating coaches over the years, Arthur Lydia, Joe Vigil, some of these like legends. So I think combining that with my own experiences and helping young coaches, because there's a lot of, you know, people getting involved in coaching now, I think that would be a lot of fun as well. But, you know, for me, it's just talking, running, doing <laughs> running, helping others is what I do. Yep. Well, you gotta, you gotta keep up with Jeff Galloway because whenever I see him, it's still enthusiastic as ever about running. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you got, you got years to go of keeping the, uh, motivation up with talking about, <laughs> I don't know how he still as enthusiastic as he is. It's, it's amazing. Um, let alone. His well, we owe a debt of gratitude to him yeah. and how Higdon in particular, those two for the second running boom. I think that they really, made the sport accessible to everyone and they provided a guide. And so I, I'm very, you know, I honor both of those guys in Mm -hmm. particular with like, thank you for all that you've done to, you know, take the sport from, you know, a niche sport to like, okay, now most everybody knows somebody who's a runner and a lot of it is because of them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for those listening, I have an interview with Jeff from about a year ago on the Running Through podcast and Hal is on the uh, Beginners uh, podcast series if you want to check that out. All right, Greg, one piece of advice you'd like to give the listeners for life? For life? Yes, for life. Wow, I don't know if I've figured it out yet. (laughs) It's uh, (laughs) scary. Um, It seems like it varies by personality, but I think the main thing is that you find your passion and try to follow that kind of your follow your bliss idea Mm -hmm. from Joseph Campbell. Uh, But then recognize that it's a windy road and sometimes you got to have a longer view than, you know, your tight, narrow view. Sometimes I try to think, well, will that matter in 10 years kind of Mm -hmm. thing? So that helps me kind of balance my drive for, you know, what I want versus the reality of the situation. Have you been reading the passion paradox? I haven't, but I have it. Right? I just got a. They sent me a copy. It's sitting right here. Yeah, I, yeah I'm reading, it reading. It's definitely, kind of what you talk about there. Um, okay, one person to follow on social media and why? Oh my gosh! Well, it must be you, right? I mean, oh no, that's cheating. That's definitely cheating. It's uh, and you can't say you can either. It's not uh, only other mutual. <laughs> oh no, well, there's plenty of mutual, but yeah, I would say search out the type of people that are having the same experience that you're having. Right. Okay. So for me, I'm a coach and a an, an master's runner. So I gravitate toward kind of following people in mm-hmm. that zone. And then other people, maybe they're younger and they're, they like to, they have their experience with running. So maybe try to find yeah, people that advice. are having your same experience. Those would be good ones for you. So you're saying I'm having the same experience as you. I don't know. I'm just, uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to say. It's one okay. You're thing not a big social media person, are you? 
You know, I used to be, yeah. but to be honest, I, I work, I mean, I coach a lot. And so I don't have as much time to do those kinds really of things. things. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably saving your, your sanity a lot as well. All right. <laughs> um, how do you want to be remembered on this show? Well, I mean, it would be great if people found some value in something that was said that maybe they can apply pretty quickly uh-huh. to their running to have a better experience. Yep. Obviously, that's what I why I do what I do. Yep, great. And I definitely would say you've done that. And uh, finally, share a running for real moment with us, something that only runners will understand. I uh, don't know which one to start with. <laughs> I would say after I ran Boston the last time I finished and I made my way through the, what appears to be the never ending finishing (laughs) shoot. You just did it. So, you know, (laughs) it's like, I just did all this and now I've got to walk 10 miles to (laughs) kind of get out of this finishing shoot. And I turned and finally met up with my wife and my son, and we're going to go back to the hotel and we go over to the curb you know, to the sidewalk. So I'm on the street and I'm going to step up onto the sidewalk. And I could not, <laughs> like, I literally could not lift my legs. So we had to hands. search out. What's that? <laughs> Did you have to lift your leg with your hands? No, we had to search out the little cut, you know, oh, where yeah. uh-huh. for wheelchairs on the corner, we had to go farther to make that. <laughs> and so I always think it's funny how you have this collection of like really fit people. Yeah. And then Within three to six hours later, they, they can't even lift their oh, leg yeah. to step on a, a step. So I think we all have that experience For of like, sure. I'm super fit. And now, oh man, I can barely lift my leg. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I definitely have a clear memory of that as well. All right, Greg, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, for being, you know, you, you credit Jeff and um, Hal a lot, but you also yourself are a huge part of the running community and just what you've done for the sport has just been amazing. So thank you as well on behalf of everyone else, but thank you for being here. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple podcasts, AKA iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, Or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. That episode explains a lot. And if you haven't already checked out his pace calculator, I think you'll find it very helpful. He's obviously a great option for a coach as well if you are looking for someone. Now you heard us talking about you can that was not set up at all I told you my embarrassing story before the episode and if you are curious and want to give it a try you can get 25% off by using code tinamure25 and while you're at it check out tribe check out body health too. Next week we have one of my lifetime heroes Sally Gunnell. If you haven't heard of her name you're probably not British but you will still be inspired by her. She's the only female British athlete to have won Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth titles and we have a really interesting chat even kind of diving into doping a little bit and how she felt lining up with people she knew could be doping. It's a great conversation I know you're going to enjoy it so enjoy your week and I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamure.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.